we're going to continue on our conversation of pressure compressor protection devices. We have a system that has a hot gas defrost. It may suddenly have a load change that allow drops and slows of liquid to a refrigerant to travel in the suction line. An accumulator in the suction line reduces the changer, danger of the liquid refrigerant to flowing into the compressor. An accumulator will also lengthen the cycling interval. It usually has aspirating or suction devices to return the oil to the compressor. Hot gas bypass devices require the use of temperature sensor attached to the suction line, controlling a solenoid valve. If there's a danger of refrigerant flowing into the compressor, the valve opens. Hot gas is allowed to flow into the suction line, heating the line, evaporating the refrigerator. Electrical heaters may also be attached to the suction line. For oil control systems, there's three basic components. You have an oil level regulator, oil reservoir, and oil separator. The oil reservoir is a dual purpose mechanism. It holds the compressor's oil supply and regulator draws from it to replenish oil in the compressor. The oil is trapped by a separator, is returned to the reservoir until needed. It may contain a sight glass for observation of the oil level. It contains a flare fitting for adding oil to the system as well. The oil separator removes oil from the hot compressed vapor as vapor leaves the compressor. The vapor flow slows down as it enters the separator. The oil collects in the separator until the desired level is reached. A float then opens a needle valve and returns the oil to the compressor crankcase. It's placed between the compressor and the condenser. In this picture you will notice where uh, the oil separator is on the red discharge line and it, the gas comes, the discharge gas comes into it, oil pools on the bottom, discharge gas goes out to the condenser, and the oil returns to the crankcase, which is the low pressure side of the compressor. The oil separator is insulated to prevent it acting as a condenser. Many of these are serviceable as well by removing the bolts. On hermetic systems, oil return line connects to the suction line near the motor compressor. There's a check valve in the vapor outlet of the oil separator which reduces the danger of oil pumping and damaging the compressor. There's a filter in the oil return line that keeps the oil clean. It may use a solenoid valve in the oil return line to allow oil or refrigerant to return to the crankcase during the off cycles. The thermostat controls the solenoid. The thermostat will close only when the oil separator is warm, usually between 100 and 130 degrees. The oil separator in large systems consists of a helical oil separator located in the upper system. and oil accumulates at the bottom, it returns through the lower outlet to the compressor. Many compressors have low side pressure control valves. It maintains crankcase low side pressure at a reasonable level. It never permits the crankcase pressure to exceed certain safe values either. It's known as a reverse metering or two temperature valve. It's needed when a compressor runs too long before the low side drops to a pressure that does not overload the compressor. If the suction line pressure exceeds safe pressure, valve shuts the suction line off from the compressor. This is an example of the low side pressure valve crankcase pressure regulator sometimes called. The valve body is made of brass, diaphragm of bronze, and a needle and set may be made of wear resistant steel alloys. It's located in the suction line between the evaporator and the compressor. In this picture it's the piece in yellow. The low side pressure control valve prevents the overloading of the compressor motor. It eliminates crankcase pressure during and after defrost cycle or normal shutdown. It closes as the outlet pressure increase. It responds to a combination of the compressor, crankcase, or suction pressures. You might have also shown in this picture is the operation of the crankcase pressure regulated valve. Again, we have the inlet pressure coming in with the red arrow pointed to the left, the outlet goes on to the compressor. Water valves are used on some larger commercial units. Water valve turns water on and off as needed and it varies the amount of water as required. There are three types of water valves, electric, pressure, and thermostatic. It's recommended that the strainer is installed in the water inlet to the valve to prevent the valve from getting plugged up. The electric water valve are, works on two types of principles, solenoid or motor operated. It's located between the water supply and the condenser mounted on the condenser base. The motor starts and stops 
the valve opening. When the motor circuit is open, the solenoid is energized and the valve closes. It consumes a very small amount of current while operating, usually between 6 to 10 watts. It may use a low voltage solenoid valve or a 120 volt solenoid valve. Large capacity solenoid water valves have a body of brass and a plunger made of non-corrosive steel. A special rubber composition is used on the valve face. In large capacity valves, water flow is constant. Gravity and water pressure close the valve when the power is shut off. Large volume water flow may be controlled by a motor operated valve. There are also pressure operated water valves. These are the most popular types of water valve. The bellows attach to the high side pressure, usually on the cylinder head. The bellows operate the valve. As the compressor rises, bellows contract. The valve is opened by a variety of mechanisms depending on the specific water valve. Water flows into the condenser to cool the compressed vapor. The valve opens the water circuit only when water is needed as the pressure rises. Water flow increases as the high pressure increases. The valve adjusts using a heavy spring pressing against the bellows. The valves are set to open at definite head pressures. Pressure depends on temperature of the water and the refrigerant used. Valves are equipped with packing lands or bellows located where the water stems enter the valve body. Packing must be adjusted to occasionally prevent leakage. Inlet and outlets are labeled. Valves are threaded for standard piping connections. The valves may have gear mechanisms for adjusting the pressures as well. Pressure operated double water valve to control flow into two separate circuits. You have a port one from the tower, you have a port two from the condenser, and you might have a third port that connects to the water supply. The thermostatic water valves are controlled by the temperature of the exhaust water. It's identical to the pressure water valves except it has a thermostatic element connected to the bellows operating the valve. Element is charged with a volatile liquid such as refrigerant. The power, the power bulb is mounted in the condenser water line and the pressure created by the liquid in the bulb opens the valve when the water becomes too warm and it will close the valve as the water cools. Manual servicing valves are common to refrigeration systems. They're used to determine operating pressures, charge or discharge a system, remove any part of the system without disturbing the other parts. These valves have to resist corrosion. They must be withstand frequent opening and closing without leaking, and the valve stems and packing must be handled with care. Larger systems may have additional service valves, some for installation purposes and some for servicing. They may have Schrader valves to connect the gauges and perform service operations. Shutoff valves are operated by hand. They may be classified as riser or manifold valves. On multiple installations, suction lines should run from the compressor to a manifold. Individual suction lines for each evaporator should go from this manifold to the evaporator. Between each suction line and manifold is a hand-operated shutoff valve mounted into the manifold. The valve permits any one suction line to close without interfering with the operation of the others. Similar manifold devices provided are for the liquid line. Valve groupings usually mounted in a cabinet or special valve board near the condenser. Riser valves is a type of shutoff valve hand-operated with three openings to which refrigerant lines may be connected. Two openings in the valve with each other on an opposite sides of the valve. A third opening is closer to the valve wheel at right angles to the other two openings. Turning hand valve in closes the opening right angles to the other two. Construction permit, permits the mounting of a valve in either a liquid or suction line. This is an example of the riser valves. Another evaporator may be connected while sh shut off from the remainder of the system by turning the valve in all the way. Relief valves are mounted on users to prevent dangerous pressures. They are required by law in most states, especially in Connecticut and Massachusetts. They're usually mounted on the liquid receiver. Hand valves cannot be placed between the system and the relief valve. National Refrigeration Code and other local codes require relief valves if the unit is greater than a certain tonnage, amount of refrigerant exceeds specified minimums, or the internal volume is great enough. There are three types of relief valves. You have a fusible plug, a rupture disc, a spring-loaded valve. 
The fusible plug is threaded for connecting to a liquid receiver. A flared fitting is used to connect the purge line outdoors to carry released refrigerant outside. Low temperature alloy in the plug melts if the receiver temperature rises above certain temperatures. If alloy melts, all the refrigerant in the system is released. Thin, the rupture disc is also a type of relief valve. It's a thin metal disc that will burst prior to reaching dangerous levels. The unit will reseal once pressures have been reduced and the system contains a filter trap to collect fragments of the rupture disc. This valve, the spring-loaded safety valve, is another type of relief valve. It uses a synthetic rubber seat and is made in several pressure ranges. It opens if the pressure is over its limit and it will reseal and close when the pressure drops to a safe limit. Relief pressure is adjustable. Once set, however, the valve is sealed to prevent tampering. Do not make relief setting um, adjustments in the field. Relief setting must not be adjusted in the field. Seal must not be broken. If it is, the valve is required to be replaced. Pressure relief usually closes at 10 to 20 percent below their opening pressure. Refrigerant lines are used in all refrigeration systems. They're hard-drawn copper pipe used to carry refrigerant throughout the system as required by the National Refrigeration Code and local codes. Fittings are not interchangeable with tubing sizes. Braised connections are used to connect fittings to pipe. Soft copper tubing is permissible at the condenser end of the lines and in the fixtures, but should be eliminated whenever possible. Vibration absorbers are required to be installed in the compressor and suction and discharge lines near the condenser. It reduces any condenser vibrations that may carry on down the lines. Two vibration absorbers placed in each line provide sound absorption. One is placed nor vertically, one is horizontally. Flexible absorber fashions the unit or wall at end pointing away from the vibration source. Do not stretch, compress, or twist the vibration absorber when installing. Mufflers are built into refrigeration circuits to break up the pressure pulses, usually in the compressor suction and discharge lines within the hermetic dome unit. Often used in commercial refrigeration systems for comfort cooling and air conditioning. Installed near the condenser, usually vertically, to provide efficient oil movement. Sight glasses are usually installed in liquid lines of commercial installations. Bubbles indicate the system is low on refrigerant or that the um, refrigerant is fractionating in the lines. A few bubbles at startup and stopping are normal, equalizing actions, and do not indicate lack of refrigerant. Bubbles may show restriction in circuit ahead of sight glass due to a partially clogged dryer, screen, or filter. Long extensions permit soldering or brazing joints without injury to the sight glass. Sight glasses can also be built into the suction line or the liquid line of the filter dryer. Sight glasses may be used on large liquid lines by installing a smaller parallel flow pipe. Bubbles in the sight glass tube may indicate a refrigerant shortage. Electronic sight glasses use sight glasses to determine levels of refrigerant. They're clamped onto the refrigeration line. Ultrasonic waves detect bubbles in the liquid flow. The unit emits an audible signal when the bubbles are present, indicating the system is low on refrigerant. It can be permanently installed for continuous monitoring or it can be used when charging a system. Moisture indicators are built into many sight glasses. A change in color indicates the moisture in the system. Turn, uh, turns pink if moisture is present in systems with R11, 12, 13, 113, or 114. If the minimum amount of moisture is present, it remains blue. It turns pink if present in R22, 500, 502. Minimum amount, the system remains green. Some moisture indicators may just show the words wet and dry when a chemical changes color. Temperature also plays a role in moisture indicators. The higher the temperature, the higher the moisture content needed to produce a color change. An indicator, if hot, can show dry even when the system has too much moisture. For accurate indicators, liquid lines should be as near as 75 degrees as possible. One hour is needed to get a good reading on a moisture indicator. Eight hours is needed for an indicator to give an accurate color signal. If an indicator continues to turn tan, the system has too much oil. Too much water or alcohol in a system will watch the chemical off indicator system and require replacing the indicator. 
Every system should have a filter dryer in the liquid line. It's a common method of removing moisture as well as other debris found in the system. Filter dryers have to have enough drying material to be used for both high and low moisture ranges. It's fully activated and keeps the refrigerant both clean and dry and again is installed in the liquid line. It consists of a cylinder, brass, copper, or steel fitted filled with a decadent chemical. Chemical can absorb 12 to 16 percent of their weight in moisture. Ends of the cylinder contain filter elements. One design allows the casing to stay in the line, only the cartridge needs to be changed. You must remove the refrigerant before opening this moisture, this filter dryer. Corrosion begins uh, with 15 parts per million of water in R12, 120 parts per million of water in R22, 15 parts per million of water in R502. Cleaning a refrigerant system involves removing the water, it's handled by the dryer, removing acid, which is also handled by the dryer, filtering out circulating solids, measuring when the dryer is completely completed, and dryer should be left in the system permanently. Cleaning a refrigeration system also says that R22 dryer must be three to five times as large as those needed for R12. 500 dryers are large as R22 dryers, and R502 and R12 dryers are the same size. The greater the ability of the refrigerant to hold water, the larger dryer is required. Suction line filter dryers are mounted in the suction line to prevent foreign particles from entering the compressor. It prevents acid, sludge, moisture, and particles over 5 microns from entering the compressor. Strainers are made of mono metal. Systems should be clean, dry, and acid free for trouble free operation. Suction line filter dryers must be replaced if pressure drop is excessive. Natural gas, gasoline, and propane engine, engines can be used to drive refrigerating compressors. Variable compressor speed products produces flexible capacity and comparatively low operating costs. Units are available in 4 to 75 tons capacity. Engine compressor units, 1 to 5 ton capacities, are used on truck units and for air conditioning. Pressure controls are placed on the low side suction line and connected to the engine's throttle, usually used. In engine-driven systems, as suction pressure increases, the angel throttle is opened, increasing the compressor speed and the rate of refrigeration. As the temperature in the evaporator drops, the engine will slow down, resulting in a balance between engine speed and low side pressure. At this point, we're done with this lesson in terms of the lecture material. You should go on to the end of your chapter, complete the end of chapter material, hand it in and then take your end of lesson quiz that that your instructor will make available